when there's a Dharma talk while you meditate, give 99% of your attention to your meditation, 1% to the Dharma talk. Let it be there in the background. At the very least, let it be a fence. So when the mind begins to wander off, you run into the talk. It reminds you, you're not supposed to be wandering off, you're supposed to be staying right here with the breath. And try to be as sensitive as possible to the way the breathing feels. When you breathe in, where is it most prominent, the sensation of movement in the body? Because breath, in, in the Buddha's analysis, is not a contact. It's not the contact of the air coming into the nose. It's part of what the Buddha calls form, your sense of the body as you feel it from within. And it's because of the energy flow in the body that the air can come in and out. So you focus on the cause and the energy in the body. Where does it be, seem to begin? You may find that it seems to come from several centers in the body, which is fine. Let them all be coordinated, but focus on the one that seems most prominent. Relax around it. One of the important points of focus in concentration practice is not that you bear down and hard on one point. Wherever you focus, you should have a sense of releasing, relaxing, opening things up. That's the kind of focus that's going to be useful. The reason I say don't pay much attention to the talk. It's because there's no way that everything in the talk is going to be equally useful to everybody here in the room or sitting outside. So if something is relevant to what you're doing right now, it'll come right in. If it's not relevant, let it go past. Maybe it's meant for somebody else. Because the Dharma that the Buddha taught had to deal with a wide variety of people. It's a Thai expression, a hundred fathers and a thousand mothers. That's where we're coming from. In other words, we each have a different background, and it's as if we're going to one spot. But some people are to the west of the spot, other people are to the east, some are to the north, some are to the south. So there are teachings that will tell you, go west. Well, those are for the people who are in the east. Teachings that tell you, go east. Those are for the people to the west. And if you're already east and you hear a teaching that says, go east, you have to stop and reflect. Where is it going to lead me? And if you have some sense of the path, you'll be able to tell, okay, this teaching is not meant for me, not for, meant for me right here, right now. John Cha talks about this. Someone, a Westerner, of course, had accused him of being inconsistent in his teachings. And he said, it's like watching people walking down the road. Some people are wandering off to the right, and you tell them to go left. Other people are wandering off to the left, you tell them to go right. The teachings have to deal with specific people at specific times. This is part of the genius of the suttas. In the Apidama, you just get lists of dharmas. But in the suttas, you get a sense of when the Buddha is teaching a particular teaching, who was he teaching, what was the problem? I'm sure there are things in the Pali Canon and the suttas that we are missing because Pali is not our native language. Occasionally, you can pick up somebody's personality. There's one sutta where there's a really obnoxious Brahmin teenager who's just finished his studies. He's full of himself. And the Buddha teaches him one way. There are other people who are more humble, and the Buddha teaches him another way. And so you get a sense of the fact that the Dharma is not just words. The Buddha was skilled in seeing which words are going to be right for this person. As I say, the Buddha would instruct, urge, rouse, and encourage. Instruction would be giving information. And the other three, rousing, encouraging, urging, 
Those were meant to get the listener to do something. And the things you would say to say a poor person to do something would be very different from what you might say to a king to get him to do something. So keep in mind the fact that the, the Dharma has lots of different applications. It all comes to one goal, and that's where all these different teachings are consistent. But there are times, say, when the Buddha would teach about self, there are times he would teach about not-self, depending on what the listener needed. Or take the Buddha's st strategy about dealing with debate. Some people come to him and he refuses to get him engaged in a debate. And there are passages where he warns the monks. You get into formal debates. A lot of times it's just about winning and losing. It's not about the truth at all. In a debate like that, you don't get involved. There are other cases, though, where the person is clearly seeking the truth, or there are people watching the debate who are seeking the truth. And in cases like that, the Buddha would engage in the debate. And it can be quite sharp. There's one particular debate where he takes on a sophist, someone who's really good at debating tricks. You can see the guy trying his different tricks, and the Buddha refuses to step into the traps. And then the Buddha creates a trap for the guy. In just a few sentences, he demolishes the guy's approach. So the Buddha can be quite merciless when it came to defeating the wrong view, but not without mercy for the person. He'd be merciless toward the view. But he'd want to help that person to see, okay, if you hold on to this view, it's going to be harmful to you. So in cases like that, he would get involved in debate. Which is why a John Fuang, my teacher, would always talking about being sensitive to time and place. He himself never wanted his teachings to be recorded. The few recordings we do have are very general Dharma teachings about generosity and virtue. A little bit about meditation, but that was because the, the listener needed to remember what he said. It wasn't intended to go much further than that. And as he pointed out, there are very few books that have come out of the forest tradition that really aren't good all around. And John Lee is good about setting out basic principles for the practice. But a lot of the other books we have are Dharma talks given to a specific group of people or a specific person, meant for that person at that time, meant for those people at that time. It may not necessarily be meant for us. And we do have a tendency when we read something like this, oh, this is, say, a John Mahabhu's position on this question, or this is a John Chan's position on this question. Well, it depends on who asked the question, what the situation was. I remember one time we got some books that someone placed here on the, on the shelves. And one morning before the meal, a John Swat went over and he picked up one of the books. Without looking at the cover, he opened it up and started reading the Dharma. He started criticizing it. He said, this is awfully basic stuff, not very insightful. And then he looked at the cover. It was a John Mahabu. He said, oh, maybe John Mahabu was talking to people who couldn't take something that was sophisticated or insightful. And that whole tendency we have to reduce certain ajans to sound bites, like that John Chai, everybody says, is all about letting go, letting go, being equanimous. But there are stories about times when he basically criticized being equanimous. The most famous one is the one of the time when the storm went through the monastery. And the next day he walked around the monastery to check on the damage, and he found there was one hut with half the roof blown off. And a monk was sitting in the hut, meditating. So I asked the monk, why aren't you fixing the roof? And the monk said, I'm practicing equanimity. And John Chan said, that's the equanimity of a buffalo, a water buffalo. 
fix the roof. Another time he was invited into the palace. It was during a time when the, the military and the students were in conflict, and both sides were calling on the king to side with them. And the king was unsure as to how to proceed. So there were three Ajahns. Ajahn Shah was the most junior. So the king asked the first two Ajahns what he should do, and both of them counseled equanimity. When he got to Ajahn Shah, Ajahn Shah said, well, equanimity is good, but you have to apply it with discernment. In other words, there's, there are times for equanimity and other times when you have to be more proactive. So we can't reduce the Dhamma to sound bites. And we can't be sure that, given a particular question, this is how the, the Ajahn would answer it. I myself, being with John Fuhr, took many years before I could get a clear sense of how he would answer questions. I try a question and get one answer one time. A couple months later, I get a different answer. Then I begin to get more sensitive to time and place and begin to see why were the answers different. And well into my years with him. If I mentioned to him one day, I had to walk up the hill to his hut to clean it. And that was the time for me to ask him questions. And so I have to, have to have to prepare the questions in my mind because I had also learned that the way you broach a question with him was really important. If you started out wrong, he would cut you off. So I practiced the questions in my mind. And there'd be days when I'd walk up the hill and I'd say, well, if I try this question, well, and he's going to answer it that way. If I try that question, he'll answer it this way. I mentioned that to him. He says, finally, we know each other. But that took years. So be sensitive to the fact that the Dharma is sensitive to time and place and person. And the Dharma that would be right for you today may not be right for you a couple months down the line. Or you hear a lesson today, it means one thing, and you hear the same lesson a couple months, and it's going to mean something else. This is a sign of a really good Dharma book. Keeping the breath in mind is good this way. You read it now. And you pick up certain things. Other things will go right past you. Practice for several months, come back, and different things will stand out. It's a book that repays rereading many times. So all Dharma teachings are aimed in the same place. But as I just said, right now you may be to the east of that place, or you may be to the west. So try to be very selective in which teachings you listen to. If you're to the east, try to get a sense of the fact that you are to the east, so you know that the Dharma for you is telling you to go west. This is why being sensitive to the Dharma is one aspect of a, of a good practitioner but also being sensitive to yourself, where you are, as the Buddha said, in terms of your conviction, in terms of your virtue, your generosity, your discernment, your learning, your ingenuity. When you have a sense of where you are, then you can get a better sense of what Dharma is right for you.